in case you weren't charged up yet. I know I am. Well, that's a perfect segue to where we wish to go now, which is to our keynote on remarks about U.S. American energy policy. And I'd like to first welcome Kateri Callahan, President of the Alliance to Save Energy, who will moderate this segment of the agenda. Kateri brings more than 25 years of experience in policy, advocacy, fundraising, coalition building, and organizational management to her position on the Alliance. Under her leadership, the Alliance conducts policy communications research, education, and market transformation initiatives in the U.S. and more than a dozen other countries to further its mission toward advancing energy efficiency. We're also proud that Kateri is all one of our e, uh, CE3 ambassadors. Welcome. Let, let me just say one thing, which is I'm teaching a class in Russia, so I hope you can say something about Russian energy policy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I have an unusual name. I'm named for an American Indian, and I just want to say it's actually Kateri for all of those of you out there, um, and I, I really appreciate the kind introduction. Um, by happy coincidence and the lucky timing of an annual conference that we do every year this past May, I was honored and privileged to be the first person to introduce Ernie Moniz in his new role as Secretary of Energy. And by a happy second coincidence today and the fortunate good timing of this event, I now have the pleasure of introducing one of Ernie's dream team, or Secretary Moniz's dream team that he's building over at the Department of Energy to help execute the President's climate agenda and clean energy agenda. And that is, um, it, I'm only introducing her not as her first time ever speaking, but as her first time speaking as a Department of uh, Energy official. And that's Karen Wayland, who has been a friend and a good colleague and uh, a work companion fighting the battle with us and with me, not for several decades, Sue, but for at least over a decade we've been working together. Um, Karen is taking a new position as the Deputy Director for State and Local Cooperation in a newly created office that I think Amy mentioned to you all earlier that Melanie Kenderdine is heading up called the Energy Policy and Systems Analysis Office. So I think it's going to be really exciting and fun to listen to Karen today because she not only has a brand new job that she's only been in for five weeks, but she's really almost at, like at a startup getting to design what her job is going to be and how she's going to execute that. So we'll look forward to that. Before we do that, though, um, I think it's really important for you to understand the kind of experience and expertise Karen is going to be bringing to that new job at the Department of Energy. Um, for about a decade, a little over a decade since I've known her, she's really been one of the most influential and effective voices on U.S. climate and energy policy that I've had the privilege to be around. She served as a senior advisor to um, now minority leader Nancy Pelosi. She served as a senior fellow to Harry Reid, the leader of the Senate, all on climate and energy policy. And throughout her career, which has taken her into the public sector, into the NGO world, and into academia, she's been making a real difference on how our country looks at and seeks to uh, tackle the enormous challenges we have with our energy use. Um, she has served, or still continues to serve, as an environmental scholar at Georgetown University, and she spent six years there helping to create other strong advocates like herself by teaching a class on policy and science, uh, uh, science and policy. So with that, um, I don't want to take any more of her time because I, for one, am very, very excited to hear what she has in store for her agenda of working with the states, with local communities, and with other stakeholders to drive the President's climate action plan and his clean energy agenda. So please join me in welcoming Karen Whalen. Thank you, Kateri. That was one of the nicest introductions I've ever had. Uh, I, I had the pleasure um, a few years ago of introducing Congressman uh, Jane Harmon for an award. I think it was the Alliance to Save Energy. And uh, I don't know how many of you know Jane Harmon, but she's a little petite, uh, Pistol, with blonde hair, um, who uh, was the lead sponsor of a bill to um, increase fuel, um, energy efficiency for light bulbs. So I was giving the introduction, and I said, how many blondes does it take to change a light bulb? One, Congresswoman Jane Harmon. But the answer, I had to say that because I was introducing the guest of honor, but the, the reality is 
two at least, and the other one is Kateri Callahan, who really has had a hand in so many initiatives to save energy around the world. So thank you, Kateri, and thank you, MIT and C3, for doing this event. This is, I mean, the dinner last night was fabulous. Thank you. It was great to hear what uh, all these interesting things that women are doing. Um, and, and the emphasis on networking that people have talked about here really is critical. Uh, when I was on Capitol Hill, I had uh, a very broad portfolio. It was energy, environment, and a number of other things. And I met regularly with large groups of, of uh, interest from around the world. Or, yeah, around the world. Um, a lot of energy people came in and out of my office. And, um, and not just the conventional oil and gas groups that came in were dominated by men, but surprisingly, even the clean energy meetings were um, dominated by men. And there were many, many times where I was the only woman uh, at the table. I was at the head of the table, but I was the only woman there. And it's astounding to me. You know, I look at the classes that I taught um, over the last 15 years or so, and uh, whether they were science classes or policy classes, they were, you know, about, there were a lot of women in the classes. There was not sort of a, a, a um, gender dominance of men, you know, you look at them, um, in 2010, women earned 58% of bachelors, 63% of masters, and 53% of PhDs across all universities and subject matter, and yet women make up only about 10% of the clean tech field, which, you know, if you are a single woman at a party looking for a date, those are great odds, but they are not so great if you are a young woman in the workforce looking for a mentor. So again, I, you know, this is this networking and the mentorship um, that C3E provides is really critical. I've had the benefit of working for some amazing mentors, Francis Beinecke, and these are people who are really leaders in the clean energy field. So Francis Beinecke, the head of the Natural Resources Defense Council, Speaker Pelosi, who is the first female speaker uh, of the House, second in line to the president, by the way, not third, second in line to the president. Um, and now I'm working for Melanie Kenderdine, who is MIT's own, um, working with Ernie Moniz. She, by the way, was told by the White House, Melanie, you have to stop hiring so many women. You got to find some men because she, like us, really wants to create opportunities for women uh, at the Department of Energy. And um, there were um, one of my friends, a young woman who's in the beginning of her clean energy career, uh, and a few other people that I know had asked me to share some anecdotes um, about where I felt that a woman being in a room actually helped change the policy outcome. And uh, I, I started to think about anecdotes, and having been in Washington for a while and being in my late 40s, I have lots of anecdotes. Um, if I want to continue working in Washington, I can't share most of them. <laughs> but I, had, I have one memory of Nancy Pelosi running us ragged on this. We were on a trip to China. We had to stop over in Alaska so our, um, so our pilots could rest. And I remember her, we, I had arranged this trip to go see a glacier, and she ran us ragged. She walked faster than even the, Ar the Air Force guards that were with her. And she was ahead of the pack, except for a couple of us who decided to run. And she was doing it in slingbacks. Um, <laughs> And then, and then Francis, I can tell this story about Francis Beinecke because I actually found it recently in a, like a Wikipedia. She was Sigourney Weaver's roommate at Yale. And as you remember, Sigourney Weaver is famous for playing Ripley in Aliens. And um, she was once asked, you know, how did you model, you know, how did you come up with the character of Ripley? And she said, whenever I wondered what, what I should do with Ripley, I always thought, what would Francis Beinecke do? So <laughs> these are my mentors. <laughs> But you know, if I go back to the, the question about anecdotes about where women in I'm answering your question, where women uh, you know have made an, a, where having women in the room have made a difference in a policy outcome, I struggled to answer that because I was in the room late at night with the Speaker of the House. I was in the room with Frances when she was um, negotiating with the rest of the envi national environmental community or with members of Congress, and and I I don't think that um, their success is, um, or in any particular moment, was because they brought some womanly virtue to the table. I think that it was because of the people that they are. And to go to what Alice was saying, um, they, they knew how to wield their power. And they weren't afraid of wielding power. And, and this is one of the things that Sheryl Sandberg talks about, get to the table. You expect to be at the table and expect to be at the head of the table. And so that's, that's my advice for you. And, um, and, uh, and I hope that um, you're all pulling the chairs up to the table. So let's talk about uh, now the topic at hand. Here we go. Uh, uh, climate and energy in the United States. We are undergoing, this is no surprise to all of you, that we're undergoing a fundamental shift in US energy systems. Um, and it's characterized by a changing supply mix, 
uh, uh, demand transformation, a growing complexity of a quite aging infrastructure, and an increased vulnerability of that infrastructure to um, both climate change and national security threats. Um, clearly, you look at this chart, you can see that natural gas is a huge driver of this transformation, with um, production increasing on the order of 15 to 20 percent a year. And you can see from this graph the, um, the very recent and dramatic change in fuel switching, fuel mix of our um, electricity generation. But natural gas isn't the only driver of this um, in a, of change in the energy system. If you look at um, the Department of Energy just released a report um, called Revolution Now that looks at four different uh, clean energy technologies. And we are in the middle of a revolution when it comes to the deployment of clean energy technologies. And this revolution is really only about five years old, but is the result of decades of, of um, of policies and um, research that the Department of Energy and, um, helped to lead. Um, wind this last year was the largest source of new electricity capacity, accounting for 43% of all new installations. We now have 60 gigawatts of wind power online. Um, since 2008, again, five years, the price of solar panels have fallen by 75%. I think other people have mentioned that this morning. And PV deployment has increased by a factor of 10. PV model, modules today cost 1% of what they did 35 years ago, which is an incredible shift in price points. And we're also now seeing that many major home builders are offering solar panels as a standard feature in a new home. Uh, LED lights, again, since 2008, just five years, the cost of super efficient LED light bulbs has fallen more than 85%, and you have many more choices, um, and you don't have to screw a light bulb in that looks like a coil if you want to put them in your chandeliers. Um, in 2009, there were fewer than 400,000 LED lights installed in the U.S. Now that number's grown 50-fold to over uh, 20 million. If you look at um, electric uh, vehicles and batteries, uh, in the first six months of 2013, Americans bought twice as many electric vehicles as they did in the first six months of the last year, um, and six times as many as the first half of two years ago, so 2011, or three years ago, I guess. In fact, the market for EVs has grown um, faster than the early market for hybrid vehicles. Um, and last, uh, last month, August, um, saw a record number of sales of electric vehicles. And the cost of the batteries in the electric vehicles has come down 50% in the last five years. And that's by far the most expensive component of, um, of vehicles. So another um, driver of this transformation is, a, is um, the relationship with the customer. It, we don't have, um, you know, the grid has always been uh, electric generators sending electrons to a user, and that's not the case anymore. Now customers can generate electricity, generate power, and send it back to the grid. Through demand response technology, you can, uh, a utility can manage peak demand by ramping down customers' uh, appliance usage instead of ramping up a power plant. And customers can get a lot more information about their energy usage, so as they learn more, they tend to actually actively manage their uh, energy consumption. Another huge driver surprise is climate change. Uh, Secretary Moniz said on his first day at DOE, I'm not here to debate what's debatable, what's not debatable, although um, somehow people in Washington continue to think that there's something to debate on whether or not climate change is happening or not. It's real, it's happening, and it is affecting our uh, electricity system, and our energy system produces 85% of the domestic greenhouse gases. So I'll state the obvious, we can't do anything about climate change unless we do something about how we produce energy. So, and I'll talk about that a little bit in a few minutes. Um, the Department of Energy just released a uh, report, U.S. Energy Sector Vulnerabilities to Climate Change and Extreme Weather, that details some current and potential future impacts of climate change on our energy infrastructure. Um, you think about increasing air and water temperatures, decreasing water availability, the increased intensity of storms, and sea level rise, those all have serious consequences on our en energy systems. If you look at um, uh, the, the big example that people point to is the effect of Hurricane Sandy on energy infrastructure. And I won't spend a lot of time on that, only to say, though, that even people who have worked in energy for many, many years we're kind of surprised by the, um, the realities of the increasing interdependence of our energy system. So for example, there might have been gas in a gas station, but without electricity, they couldn't pump the gas. Um, so we, at, at the Department of Energy, the way they, they tried to keep track of where the gas was was to actually look at credit card receipts. Because if, if you could get a credit card receipt, that meant there was a transaction. That meant both that the gas station had gas and had electricity. 
Um, other, other impacts on the energy system that we've already witnessed. You may have heard that a nuclear power plant in Illinois this summer had to get special permission from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to continue generating electricity because the um, cooling pond had reached 102 degrees. Um, in 2010, the Bonneville Power Association lost $164 million um, in large part because of the um, decline in snowpack meant that they couldn't generate enough hydropower to, um, and they lost significant revenues. And this August, um, you may have been following those of you from California, um, that uh, the governor had to declare a state of emergency because of the um, rim fires moving into Yosemite, which were threatening the transmission lines that bring electricity into San Francisco. So in recognition of the threats that climate change poses um, to our economy, to our way of life, to our national security, um, the president recently released a climate action plan. Um, and there are three pillars of that plan, mitigation, so reducing um, uh, global warming causing emissions. The second is adaptation, so dealing with the worst impacts of climate change. And the third is international cooperation, because we can't meet this challenge all on our own. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the Department of Energy's role in the Climate Action Plan. The first is power plant standards. Well, uh, you may know that the EPA actually promulgates power plant standards. And today, uh, Administrator um, Gina McCarthy announced the first ever uh, climate standards for new power plants. Um, in a year and a half, two years, the president has um, directed the EPA to come up with standards for existing power plant standards, for existing power plants. And the Department of Energy has a huge role to play, not in the standards themselves, although a lot of our analytical capability will, will help support the EPA and actually the substance of the rule. But like Alice mentioned, we have a huge role to play in helping states and local governments to, um, institute the policies and programs and incentives they need to see a path to compliance to um, these standards. So that's one thing that we're doing. Uh, you know, we will continue to work on renewable energy. We uh, will continue to make massive investments in clean energy innovation. And I should note that this is not just renewables. This includes fossil fuels, trying to make fossil fuels um, uh, still continue to be a viable power source in a carbon-constrained world. And to that end, um, we are, have about $14 billion in loan guarantees and R&D funding for clean coal technologies. Uh, energy efficiency standards, we just finalized some standards that have been held up for quite a while, um, one for microwave ovens. There'll be lots more. I think we have 30-something more. Is that right? 30 more um, efficiency standards that were planned. I should ask you. 30 more? Yeah. Um, so the Department of Energy will continue to work on the, the standards. Um, and this has been mentioned a couple times today already. The president directed um, the administration to do the first ever quadrennial energy review. So uh, agencies, the, the kind of quadrennial review model began in the 1990s with the Department of Defense trying to answer the question, how do we, how do we wage two wars? And what, would, what, what is our mission and how do we answer that? Well, um, since then they have uh, done quadrennial review, so every four years, and they've taken different forms. And then the uh, Intel community has done a, a quadrennial intelligence review. The VA has done one. And really, they're a, they're a way for an agency to examine the mission in the face of a changing world to decide how to move forward and, and set a policy agenda um, that, that changes the trajectory. So here at um, the Department of Energy, the, the quadrennial energy review for um, for the administration, is going to be run by the White House, so the D Domestic Policy Council and the Office of Science and Technology Policy. But the Department of Energy will be running the secretariat that will actually operationalize the, the, what we call the QER, um, to use a Washington acronym. Uh, and um, we will be, if you look at the number of agencies that have a place in energy policy, it is, you, you're easier to find an agency that doesn't have a place than to find one. I mean, there's, I think we've got 15, a list of 15 everywhere from the interior, EPA, um, uh, um, HUD, um, interior, uh, let's see, well, you, you can't, I think Social Security is probably the only place where you're not dealing with energy. So we have an Im immense job of, of coordinating the interagency work. But also, um, many of you will be hearing from me because I'll be leading the stakeholder input. And we need lots of help from the external groups, from states, from companies, from trade associations, from the NGO world, to help us figure out the questions that we should be um, asking to make sure that we are focused on the right and the right things, and also to get your ideas for innovative solutions for how we meet our goals. So um, the first QER is going to be focused on infrastructure. And um, 
And we are in the process of really trying to figure out what our definitions are, what our scope is, what our, how we're going to develop scenarios with which we sort of um, test our, our recommendations, and then trying to figure out exactly what our outputs are going to, are going to be looking like. Um, obviously, when we talk about energy infrastructure, pipes, wires, plants. Those are the basics, and if you, and that has not necessarily changed. You think about we've got over 5,300 power plants, over 200,000 miles of high voltage transmission lines, over 300,000 miles of uh, natural gas pipelines, and those are only in the lower 48 alone, not counting anything in Alaska. Um, we also have to think about transportation infrastructure because more, more and more um, uh, energy goods and services are moving across um, our transportation network. So I found this statistic astounding. In 2008, 9,500 rail cars of crude oil. Just um, five years later, that number is 234,000 rail cars of crude oil. So um, energy companies are more and more turning to um, rail to move uh, not just coal, but but crude oil because it provides them a lot of flexibility to move that product back and forth from shifting um, locations of, of production. We also are trying to figure out where we draw the bounds of this infrastructure review. Um, and as has been noted many times today, buildings potentially become energy infrastructure. They, they can produce energy as well as consume it, and then they have these intelligent designs within the building that actually help modulate demand. So we're trying to figure out how we, um, how we build in a building component into the QER. Another question is, do we include electric vehicles as energy infrastructure? Not if you don't plug them in, but when you start plugging them in and they serve as um, a potential storage unit for um, helping to respond to peak demand, then we have to consider, is an electric vehicle uh, part of our energy infrastructure now? So, and then how do we deal with water energy nexus? I mentioned cooling towers and, and cooling ponds, but there's also an added dimension. So we have water in the production of energy. We also have water that consumes energy, significant amount of energy, both to transport and treat water. And you can imagine that in a world where um, water availability is changing, that you might see some cities start to invest heavily in new ways of treating water, like uh, desalination plants, which could put a huge demand on the energy grid. So where we draw the bounds and, and the taxonomy that we use, are, are really we're really grappling with that right now. Um, and hopefully we'll have that figured out before in two weeks the president uh, issues his uh, official memorandum getting us started. We're looking at um, scenarios. Uh, you know, this is going to produce a four-year um, policy horizon, a policy prescription. But we're really looking at how do we affect what the energy infrastructure looks like in 2030. Uh, we have emissions reductions targets. The president said um, that we should be aiming for 17% emissions reductions by 2020. We have renewables targets uh, at, in a State of the Union address. He talked. The president talked about getting to 80% clean energy, and that's not just renewables, but 80% clean energy by by um, a date in the future. Um, and then we have, obviously, energy security, economic competitiveness, and resilience, both to um, natural threats, but also to um, hurricanes and other climate effects. So we're looking at a four-year planning horizon for energy policy and technology investment. We will be producing recommendations for legislation, administrative action, an agenda for um, uh, financial incentives and research and development to support the modernization and transformation of our energy infrastructure. And I do want to emphasize again that we're not doing this alone. We will be doing it with lots of other agencies, but we absolutely have to be doing it with people from the outside. So we are witnessing the first steps towards uh, uh, new ways of producing, transforming, and using energy in this country. And hopefully we'll be working all with all of you that we can chart a path forward to, for transforming our energy systems from one that is dependent on carbon to one that is dependent on innovation and that meets the challenges of the 21st century. And one that I hope includes a growing number of women shepherding that, transmission, that transformation through uh, 2030. So thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. I'll just sit over there. We're going to put her in the hot spot, the hot seat over right. here, and ask some questions. So, first, thank you for the remarks, and it looks like you've gotten a lot, um, really gotten hit the ground running in the five weeks since you've been there. So, it's been a lot, very fun. Okay, so I'm going to ask just a couple of questions, and then we'll open it to the floor. Um, but one of the things that we really haven't talked about, though it's been mentioned many times, that Melanie's created this new office of policy and systems analysis, and um, I know that it's been split. You took the policy office and international 
um, relations and split those two. But can you talk to us a little bit about what the idea is behind creating this policy and systems analysis and how that's going to change policy work, in your opinion, at the Department of Energy? Sure. So. Um, Previously, and I think in the Clinton administration, uh, the, there was a separate policy shop. And in fact, Melanie Kender and I led a policy shop for, she's been with four secretaries of energy. So at one point, she was leading a separate policy shop that reported directly to the secretary. And over time, that policy function at the secretarial level was combined with international affairs. And those are two very different functions in terms of the people and the expertise. And, it, and it, over the last few years, it seemed that that office had a much stronger emphasis on international affairs. And what I think happened was that it, within the um, within the programs, they saw a real need for domestic policy expertise and function and began to build out their own policy functions. And the Department of Energy is famous for stovepipes. And, <laughs> and, and because the secretary was there as the undersecretary um, a few years ago, he was well aware of both the strengths and the weaknesses of the department and has placed a great emphasis on trying to break down those stovepipes and having a much more coordinated um, fashion. So Alice's team is a, is a result of, of the secretary's um, desire to break down some of those stovepipes, really beefing up uh, at the, uh, you know, on what they call the seventh floor uh, level of investment in the state and local outreach. Melanie's team, the uh, energy policy and systems analysis team, is another um, evident evidence of that emphasis, which is to pull some of the policy people and functions out of the um, programs and put them in a shop that reports directly to him so he can have uh, sort of more direct but also more coordinated um, advice to him on policy development and analysis. So we have um, five divisions within uh, uh, what we call EPSA, another Washington acronym. We have uh, climate and um, climate, environment, and efficiency. We have a team that's looking at um, financial issues, so markets and incentives. We have a team looking at energy security, so that will be um, a lot of uh, the the sort of oil and gas. Mm -hmm. And then my team, which will be looking at state, local, and tribal cooperation, how we I, um, help d develop um, analyses that speak to what the states need, how we help to strategize on how the Department of Energy allocates resources to the states, and then um, how we can be better salespeople for the work that um, the department does with states and locals. And, and then finally, the final um, team is an integrative team that's going to be looking at sort of big picture and all the interdependencies of energy. Sounds great. It does sound like a startup in a way, just yeah. putting this all together. So let, let's go back for a moment, though, to your role with the states and tribal communities. One of the things that the president announced in his State of the Union was creation of an energy efficiency race to the top, mm -hmm. modeled on the education race to the top to provide incentive funds for states to um, buy into the game of doubling energy productivity between now and 2030. Um, given the disappointing shenanigans on the Hill and we're not likely <laughs> to get anything more than a continuing resolution. Um, can you talk a little bit about that project or program or other ways that you're looking to engage states which really have uh, led in the creation of a clean energy economy, in my opinion, and in addressing climate challenges? Well, Alice and I have been getting briefed by um, all of the programs at the Department of Energy, and there are a significant number of programs that are focused at the state and local level. Um, every, you know, and not just at the state and local level helping governments, but also things like the Better Building Challenges, which is really aiming at a, at a sort of building owner. How, how many buildings can we get to meet an energy efficient challenge? So there's a, there's a whole suite of programs that are available, and I think what has happened is that, that again, with the stove piping and with the, um, the everyone is working uh, on their projects, but if a state person wants to figure out what's available at, to the department, they have to know the specific person who's working on a specific program, and they shouldn't have to do that. So one of the things that Alice has been doing, and she's very much going to be managing those relationships and trying to improve the outside world's relationship with um, with the Department of Energy, they shouldn't have to call um, around the the seven or eight floors and three buildings to figure out how the Department of Energy can help them. So delivering our services better in a more targeted way is definitely one of the things that we're going to be doing. Um, having been there for five weeks, I cannot speak to every single one of those programs, but just know that the Secretary on a regular basis is asking for results on how we can better improve our relationship with states because, as he says, uh, you know, energy is, is ultimately a regional issue and a lot of the work to both regulate energy and to do create the innovative programs and policies is happening at the state level. Oh, yeah, that's great. So 
Um, Harkening back to your days on the Hill, and I'm sure you watched, um, as many of us did inside the Beltway, the Congress tried to, try the Senate to. tried, yeah, it was really sad, sad to watch, but the Senate tried to get forward a bipartisan clean energy piece of legislation introduced by Shaheen and Portman, um, and that had to be removed from the table because of um, amendments that had absolutely nothing to do with energy and everything to do with Obamacare um, and, and insistence upon those. And I ask that you have that experience up on the Hill. A lot of insiders believe that the Congress is going to be incapable of doing anything on clean energy or climate legislation um, in, the, in this Congress and maybe even in the next. And so I'd love your comments on that, if you can do that and still go back and work inside the, the Beltway. I don't know as an agency employee whether I'm allowed to, <laughs> or, and to then, make comments. Well, like the it. second part, maybe you can then, because I know that the president has announced that he's going to do everything he can from the executive branch. If the Congress won't right. move, the executive branch will. So maybe you right. could make some comments well, around that. I've always said that um, that getting Congress to move, I mean, let's face it, the, the founding fathers did not intend for it to be easy to get things through Congress. I don't think they intended it to be as hard as it is right now. But really, the, the House and the Senate, the, the whole system was designed so that very few bills actually get through and become law. So I have always believed that uh, that in order to get Congress to move and to get Washington to move, you need a vice grip. And that vice grip is the states and locals taking action on one side and the international community taking action on the other side. And, and slowly, you'll, you'll change um, the way businesses make their investments. You will change um, the way politicians at the state level who then run for national office think about an issue. And, and you get sort of slow change at the congressional level. And I think, um, you know, and, and there's also a pendulum of things that... Right. that that things will things will swing the other way at some point, but what we're seeing at the state level is is ground ground it's a groundswell of change. Yeah. And when you leave Washington and you sit in some of these states, even states that you wouldn't necessarily think are are you wouldn't think that they're the most progressive states in terms of clean energy policy, things are happening. People are making money, and um, customers are demanding new things. So it's happening out there, and Congress will eventually have to have to catch up. Whether it's in, because of an election cycle or because businesses gather together again and really demand change, but in the meantime, the president is not waiting for Congress to take action, and he w is planning on using all of his uh, executive authorities. Um, and so that's why you're seeing the power plant standards. You're seeing this heavy um, uh, emphasis on efficiency standards, on adaptation, and so things are moving. Good. Things are moving. I could sit here and ask you questions all afternoon, but we have five minutes, and I, I want to open it now to folks in the audience who may want to ask Karen questions. This lady. Hello. Uh, my name is Jackie Crespo, and I'm at the Harvard Business School. And uh, Karen, I can't tell you enough how much I appreciate all that you've done in your, in, your, in your career to advance climate and energy goals. You've really been a true public servant. And She's my friend, Yay. by the way. I, I, my I, former I, colleague <laughs> saying these nice things about me. And, uh, but it also, it also means a lot. <laughs> For people who were in the weeds in Washington, to have someone like you with your credentials now in a role where you can actually drive a lot of change and that the DOE is really focused, even though some folks in the outside community might not realize how hard the folks at the DOE work, so I do appreciate that. I guess my question is, what can we do now for folks who aren't in Washington or aren't in the public sector at the state level? What can we do if we're in academia or in the private sector to help your mission, to help those at, at the DOE actually reach their goals? Because you speak a lot, and so do uh, your other colleagues, about engaging with the private sector and academia. But can you give us some tangible examples on how we can do that and coordinate? Um, yeah, you know, people are really hard on lobbyists in Washington. And I think the unfortunate thing about that is that in your daily life, especially people who are running startups, um, executives who are really busy, you don't, you know, students, you don't have an opportunity to, you don't have time and you don't know what the, what the um, doors are to open to actually have your voice heard. And I think if you look at trade associations, um, NGOs, you look at um, some of the, the, you know, GE and Honeywell, your lobbyists are actually doing fabulous things in Washington at the state level. So I, I would encourage you, if you're really busy, to seek out some of these and, and there are representatives of a lot of these organizations here today, the American Energy Economy, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Alliance to Save Energy. There are fabulous um, nonprofits, trade associations, and companies that are working in your space that have 
lobbyists, and it is not a scarlet L. I had the scarlet L on my chest <laughs> for a couple years, and I could not go into the administration until I wiped that off. But I think that's a shame because the, the, they are channeling voices to decision makers, um, and that's their job to do it. It's their job to represent these interests in front of the people who make decisions. And so I, I think that you know, if you're really busy, oh, and there's a lobbyist sitting next to Jackie, by the way. Yeah. I did, which I forgot about until I just saw her there. Uh, I think I think it's you know when you're busy, go find the people who are getting paid to do this. Can can I add to that? Because someone that's <laughs> that's doing this, we have at the Alliance to Save Energy a group called our E Advocates, and these are self-selected people that sign up so that when we need help, and this is on energy efficiency, but our 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 compatriots mm -hmm. on the renewable energy and clean energy have analogs to this. But we, you sign up for it, we give you a note to drop to your congressman, your congresswoman, your senator, whomever we're speaking to. We even send messages out to states. So we have everybody disaggregated by uh, zip code. So all with a couple of clicks on your computer, you can send your own message. You can customize it if you want, or you can use the message that we've sent. And you can get that out. So for Shaheen Portman, for example, we, we in, in 15 minutes had 2,500 people contact their members of Congress asking them to move on that bill. So do that with us. Sign up with whatever your trade association is and have them send you an alert and be a part of the process because your voice means a lot more than a lobbyist voice going in and, and speaking. They want to hear from their constituents. Another question, well, let's see, right here? It's, or wait, who's got the, oh, back there. Okay, sorry. Uh, hello, okay, it's on. Um, I'm Lisa Lillilun with Mago Networks, and I'm in the private sector. And I just wanted to say to both of you and to the people organizing this, some of your slides, Karen, were just great. And it was exciting to start from 1950 and see the growth in so many of the areas that we're all rooting for. It'd be wonderful if there was a place where we could have some great PowerPoints that we don't have to invent that we could have in our arsenal and then we could all be ambassadors because you know for one of the first times there are more jobs in solar and wind than there are coal miners and there are all these great success stories of the products and the growth so if we had that those statistics easily at hand there it's a great success story that I'd like to be able to more easily share with people. That's great. Well, I will tell you that the slides that I used, um, the the uh, the four slides that showed the change in price and deployment, those just came out of our Revolution Now report, which is online on the web. And I believe that you can right click on the on the graph and and use it. I mean, it's in the public domain now. So, um, and then the other graph was an EIA graph, the natural gas. So, let me take one more. Now. One one more question. Well, we've got all kinds of hands up here. How about this lady right here? She's closest to the mic. Sorry. Hi, my name is Hillary Staver. I'm from Yale University. And I was wondering, so the, the work that your team will be doing with state and local governments, is the main focus more sort of sharing best practices and learning across, across the state level, or sort of recalibrating the work that the states have done to bring it up to the federal level and translate it into policy there, or, or both? And if both, are there different approaches that you need to take in order to work towards those two goals? Yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, so I, my, my team will, will have two main things that we'll be working on in the next year. The first will be the Quadrennial Energy Review, and there we'll both be going out and speaking about the QER so that people are aware that's happening, and then going out and um, soliciting input back in. And a lot of that will come from the state and local governments. And one of the things that my team will be doing will be looking for really neat and innovative um, state finance examples, state um, renewable policy examples, state efficiency examples, and trying to find a way to highlight those and and then build plans in the QR and recommendations for how to replicate those going forward. Um, the other, the other piece that we want to look at is this: you know, how do you get, um, how do you help EPA in in pushing forward on the power plant standards? How do you um, work with the states to? Um, help them develop the programs and policies that get the emissions reductions that you would need when a standard comes out. And that's going to be done in a variety of ways. And Alice and Alice is working on sort of, she's got a much expanded team. My team is new and will be expanded. And we'll be working together on both, my team will be working with the rest of EPSA to do a lot of the analytical work um, that states need in terms of you know, developing reports that we can then push out, um, developing strategies and highlighting um, where and which states 
some of DOE's resources can make a particular um, difference in, and I wouldn't say bring it up to a federal level because I think that's a low bar, but, um, but, but actually helping the states, and all states are different, and they all have different fuel mixes, they have different business, you know, business um, sectors, but really what, what is it that the state can do to change their policies and programs and create new financial incentives to, um, to allow all of the interests in the state, the public utilities, the businesses, the state legislature, the governor, to allow them to see a path forward in a carbon constrained world so that when new initiatives come out from the administration that are kind of the hammer, that they've got tools to meet those with and they, they see that, you know, path to compliance. So good luck on the new job. We're so happy to have you back in Washington, D.C. Please join me in thanking Kim.